We are living through the most exciting, challenging, and most critical time in human history. Never before has so much been possible, and never before has so much been at stake. That's a quote by Peter Russell in Rhonda Byrne's book, The Greatest Secret. And we talk with Peter in today's episode of Letting Go and The Greatest Secret. Peter Russell is a physicist and leading thinker on consciousness. He has authored 10 books, including From Science to God and Seeds of Awakening. His mission is to distill the essential wisdom on human consciousness found in the world's spiritual traditions and to explore their teachings in contemporary ways. Let's start out by uh, you been focusing a lot lately uh, around letting go. Uh, mm -hmm. So can you speak a little bit about how letting go relates to the greatest secret? Since that's what brought us together is the greatest secret. Right. Both yeah. of us being in that book. So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I think letting go is something that is at the core of all the world's spiritual traditions, whether yeah. it's, you know, looking at letting go of ego, forgiveness, I mean, letting go to the divine. It, it, it's th throughout the world's religious traditions. And basically what letting go, what holding on does is it keeps us away from ourselves, from our true nature. Holding on keeps us stuck in concern, worries, thinking, and letting go is actually just, it's really ultimately, it's about letting go of the ego thinking mind, the e what I call the ego mind. That's not all thinking, but the, that sort of egoic thinking, which keeps us trapped in worry and concern and what we're doing, et cetera, and what are people thinking of us. Sure. And often we use ego as a noun, like there's something called an ego, some inner entity which is controlling us or running us and a lot of teachings say we've got to get rid of the ego or whatever it is or overcome it or let go of it i don't see the ego as a thing if i look inside myself i don't find some entity called ego what i find is there's that deeper sense of me which is always there and there's various what I call egoic thoughts, thoughts of, you know, worries about what's going to happen, thoughts about what I should say to somebody else. And basically, most of these thoughts are around how do we become safer, more secure? How do we find our way to peace? How do we get more love? But they're, they're all thoughts about what I need, what I need to get from the world, what I should do, etc. And so that's why I call it the ego mind. It, it's a state of mind we get into, a mode of thinking we get into, which is ultimately it's how do I get the world to be the way I think it should be in right. order, in order for, with that. <laughs> in order for me to feel at peace and right, be happy right, right. and be loved. So it's right. basically the ego mind is looking out to the world how can, how can I get it to be the way I want it to be? Yes. And that keeps us, as I say, it keeps us looking out. And so letting go of the ego mind for me is stepping back from that thinking. It's like, it's almost like recognizing the thinking, pausing and coming back and saying, ah, here I am, the me that's always present behind all the thinking. And we come back closer to our, to our true self. We come back closer to our own, being this and I think mm -hmm. that's what the greatest secret is about is that coming back to our own being and the fact of just here I am the one that is aware of all this so so that that's how I look at ego not as a thing but as a mode of thinking we get caught in yes. and, it's, and that's important because if we see it as a thing like some inner entity we then start thinking you know as I said how do we get rid of it what do we do about it if we see it as a mode of thinking it's much easier because we can step out of that mode of thinking any moment of the day when we recognize it, we can step out of it. So it's about letting go of that mode of thinking, coming back to ourself. 
And so the practice isn't something about how do we eventually, after years of meditation or whatever it is, overcome the ego. It's about stepping out of it any time of the day, any day. Yes, I love that. I Because it there's this huge misconception that I, I'm glad you, I asked you that question because there's this huge misconception that we have to go to war with it. We have yeah. to uh, uh, wrestle it to the ground and beat it up. Right. Which just, in my experience, that just feeds it. And exactly. it, it, and it's creating your, your uh, shadow boxing with a phantom. Right. And exactly. it doesn't do anything, really. Right. Like, and also to recognize this way of thinking is not an enemy it's actually an ally it's trying to help us survive and be safe in the world so it, it has a role to play it has a very important role so if you know what if, if there's a you know bus coming at you down the street the ego mind says hey you know for self-preservation you to get, get out of the way right so or, or whatever it is so the ego mind has very important role to play when our when our safety or security is at stake in some way. Mm -hmm. The problem is this mode of thinking gets activated most of the time when it isn't needed. It's because we, we imagine some fear in our mind about what might happen tomorrow if this didn't go or whatever. So we get caught in a lot of thinking. And the ego mind gets activated when, the, when there's absolutely no need to. And so what happens is, I think for many of us, we're, we're in that mode of thinking, you know, maybe 80, 90% of the time, and most of it isn't needed. But the point is, it does have an important role. It's not something to be got rid of. It's something to be let go of when it isn't necessary. Yeah, I like the way you put that, because I think it, it's um, Ramesh to made a distinction between the thinking mind and I don't remember how he defined pure mind, but pure mind is just doing what it needs needs to do to maintain the, the, the body. And that doesn't drop away. And a lot of fears I think people have is they think, oh, I, I, I can't mess with this because I'll die. Right. And the, in my experience, the exact opposite is true. We're right. sabotaging our, our mm. all the extra thoughts that you're talking about letting go of is sabotaging of that, mm. isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, people think, oh, you know, if I step out of this sort of personal self, what's going to happen? You know, where will I be? And the answer <laughs> is you will still be there and you will be observing what it is like not to be caught up in thinking, but the I is still there. And that, that sense of inner I-ness, that deep sense of I-ness, which is always present, becomes more clear as we step back from the thinking. But also, just to make one point in terms of what you were saying just then, it, it isn't about getting rid of all thought. I mean, what I find is there's always some vague level of thinking going on, even if my mind is you know, very quiet, there may be thoughts about it like, ah, oh, yes, this is nice, or yeah, ah, oh, I recognize this, or whatever it is, or, but they're not thoughts that take you out of the present moment, whereas the ego's thinking takes you out of the present moment. But I, I just want to emphasize that because people often think, oh, you know, meditation means getting rid of all thoughts. Now, it's certainly true that sometimes in deep meditation, thinking has completely stopped, but most of the time, the subtler levels of thinking which continue and they're absolutely fine. Yes, but and I'm just... glad you're making that point because the uh, it's it's aren't you really talking about freedom with the mind as opposed to being totally free of the mind? Yes, yeah. And another way, but it's freedom from the machinations, the dictates of the ego mind. It's freedom from that, freedom to just be yourself, and then in that quietness we're much better able to decide what is the most appropriate action here. I remember Alan Watts, one of my favorite lines from Alan Watts was, he said, sometimes we have to stop thinking in order to know what to think about. Because <laughs> the, when the ego Good mind- quote. No, no, I know. When the ego mind's got us, it's insistent. This is what we must do. This is what we must do. And that's something, that's the way we can recognize it when it gets insistent. 
Yes. And so when, you just, when we step back from that, there's a sense of, ah, there's a freedom. There's here, here I am. Now, let me, we can bring in our wisdom and decide, okay, what is the appropriate thing for me here in this situation? Right. Yeah, it, it's still, they're still functioning, still yeah. functioning. Yeah. And I love that you said that it's just a mode of thinking because if people can really get that, that there's no boogeyman, there's no thing there, and it's just a mode of thinking, I think that's less threatening. It's not just less threatening, it's more, it sounds more achievable because everyone has experienced changing modes of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, absolutely. That's really what letting go is. I mean, I'm just to say, it's just a change of mind. Instead of being caught up in a certain way of seeing things, it's, it's relaxing the mind and coming back to, as I say, to being ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't it also one of the other clues, uh, would you agree with this, that the, one of the other clues is if it's not about what is actually here now, that's a, a big clue. If you're thinking about what was or what might be, that's a big clue that that's probably just the, the thinking mind. Yes, it is. And nearly all our thoughts in one way or another about the past or the future. Yes. And even when they're about the present, we can still sort of get, they, they trigger thoughts about the past or future. And it's like, yes. I may say, you know, I was saying just now, it might be in a very quiet state of meditation thinking, oh, this is lovely. And then the mind may go, oh, I must remember to do this more often or right, 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 whatever. Right. So we, we yes. immediately gravitate out of the present into the, into the past or future so easily, yes. so easily. So what do you recommend we do about that? Or how, well, can we, how can we explore that further? I think, I mean, something we touched upon is when you, is when you recognize you're caught in it, is first of all. And I find two ways to recognize it. One is what we just mentioned. There's an insistency to it. When I notice my thinking is insistent, you know, you must do this, you must say this to this person, or you mustn't do that. When there's an insistency, that's the ego's job to be insistent. You know, if there's a bus coming, it needs to be insistent. Right. Get, <laughs> get out the way. It is if, all... they, if they're just going, oh, yeah, whoa, maybe they're not I... insistent, you're... Um, you're flat. <laughs> I haven't worked out the trajectory of the bus yet. It may be okay, maybe not, but right, get right. out of the way. Yeah, so yeah. it's insistent. It's nearly always insistent. It takes over. It dominates. Like this is what you need to do or whatever it is or not do. Right. The other way of recognizing it is there's nearly always a sense of background tension to it. Mm. And I think this is almost the hallmark of egoic thinking. There's a background tension. It's not often very noticeable. It's just faint. And it comes from two things. One, in that mode of thinking, we're focusing on something, focusing on some idea, we're working something out, we're following a thought through. And even that focusing of the mind onto a thought takes a bit of effort, creates a bit of tension. And also a lot of the thoughts that we're going through in that mode are things that might have their own worries and anxieties or whatever, they might have their own tension. So that's another way of recognizing it's when you notice the mind isn't completely relaxed. There's a sense of tension there. And so ways to step out of it, this is the first thing is to recognize it. Recognize, ah, I'm caught in some egoic mode of thinking. When you recognize it, then I think that the simplest thing is to pause it, just to not be interested in that thought anymore, just to take away your interest. Because once you recognize it, then this got two things are, ah, there's me here and I'm recognizing that thinking. And then the me here, you know, the deeper me can just say, okay, let me just not follow that thought anymore. And then we've basically stepped out of it and then come back to noticing how it is not to be caught up in that mode of thinking, just noticing how it is. And nearly always there's a sense of, relief, ease, and inner calm, things like that. It's like, ah, and, and that allows us to come back closer to ourself. And it's really, it's really just allowing the mind to relax, which is in deepest way, it's allowing the attention to relax. So whatever our attention is on, just letting the attention relax from that focus and just coming back to, ah, yes. 
This mm. is me here. This is the present. Just you speaking about it, it, it happens naturally. The, the, yeah. It's, it's, one, it's a wonderful pointer. So speak a little bit more about that. I'm really enjoying this. It's so, it's so easy in a way. It's, it seems like, it sounds like it's very difficult and it's a challenge and it's a challenge to remember to do it. And we can easily get caught up in trying to do it, but actually really there's nothing simpler. We're just not actually doing the thinking anymore. We're just letting it, letting ourselves relax. And, and in that ease, and there is an ease that comes with that, because I said the thinking mind, the ego mind, not to, sometimes the thinking mind is great, but the ego mind has this tension. When we, when we let that relax, and just like, ah, the sense of beingness is there. And what I do is I just notice, ah, how, how does it feel to just be here? And I start noticing what's happening around me more. And then just noticing the quietness, that inner sense of quiet that's there, the calm and allow myself to rest in that. And then just to say, well, you know, and am I not the one that is aware of this? Am I not that which is aware of all this? And that brings me back to just here I am, the awareness, which is aware of all that's going on. And then just to, to rest in that awareness. Yeah, that's very well. Well put, and I, and I love your unique way of asking that question. It's a little different than what's in the the greatest secret, but uh, I like it's kind of a mind stopper. It is it's, a, it's not the way first... the mind would actually usually ask it, but when you ask it that way, it has it. It almost makes it also it almost causes the mind to stop thinking right in that moment. Is that right. its intent? Yes, it's a it's a convoluted question deliberately. It's a sort of rhetorical question, but it, it does it stops the mind and it's really saying, um, you know, it's a, it's like a question that brings you back to yourself. I, I, instead of saying, "Am I aware?" which the thinking mind can get engaged in that sometimes. Am I aware? Well, yes, I suppose I, whatever it is. But this is a way of actually more directly coming back. I find, and it's something. I picked up actually from another great teacher, Rupert Spira. He uses this a lot. And it's something that I, when, when he first said it, when I first heard him say it, everything just dropped away mm. for me. It was like, ah, it's like, so the way, way I phrase it, it, there's various little phrasings like, but, but am, am I not that which is aware? Am, am I not the one that is aware of this? So it's, as it's a sort of, almost a double negative but as you say it brings us it brings us back so yeah, i'm glad you repeated it first yeah, so people could remember it it's not saying if am i am i aware of it but which gets i say gets into mind but am am i not the one that is aware of this yeah. right now am right. i not the one that is present to this right now yes yeah i find that uh, both work but what you're what you're talking about is a great way to approach it, approach it. And, and it's, I'm glad we acknowledge Rupert. I, I love to acknowledge source whenever I can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward. We're, we'll be having a conversation soon. I'm looking forward to that. Good. So yes, he's a wonderful teacher. Yes, he is. Uh, again, I, uh, doing these podcasts have been such a treat for me because I usually am just within my own network. Mm -hmm. uh, leading seminars and focusing on how I express truth. It's not really me, as you know, how truth expresses through this particular body mind. And it's been so much fun to mm -hmm. connect with everybody in the greatest secret and notice the beauty of how that one awareness expresses through so many apparent these separate vehicles. It's right. just been very inspiring and really a lot of fun. And right. plus I'm getting to meet all these amazing people. So it yeah. works for me. <laughs> and it, uh, you mentioned that one awareness. It is, that is the same for each of us. I yeah. mean, we are, all, we are all totally different in terms of, you know, my concerns, my thoughts, my needs, my background, my history, all of that is, is unique to me. 
and you have yours. Everybody has their own inner world, which is unique. And I may have some idea of yours by what you tell me about yourself and you know what you think and what you've been through. But this, this just being aware, and this is something all the great mystics point out, it cannot be put in words. Mm. When, we, when we drop back into just, ah, here I am, that which is aware, it is on the one hand so obvious, it's so familiar because it's been there all our life, but we haven't noticed it because we've been looking out into the world on what we're doing, what we're, most of our thinking is out into the world, as we said. So when we, when we drop back into our, into our being, I, I like to call it our being, it's just the most neutral word I can think being, of. Being, yes, it's a great being. term. We drop back into our being. Well, actually, the way I sometimes phrase it is we drop back into our aming. Or what? <laughs> aming, A-M-I-N-G. So being- Oh, aming, being, yes, yes, being I didn't understand verb. it first. And the first person of the verb is I am. Right. You know, it, I am, you are, it is. So being, when we, when we experience it for the first person, it is just that sense of I am. And I, some, I, I like to drop the am in a way, be, drop the I, sorry, because it can be a distracting noun and just say, there's just amness or amming. Mm. And that sense of amming, has no qualities to it. It's something we know, but there's there's no words we can put to it. I mean, not because we don't have the words, but because there are no qualities that need describing. And so that sense of how it is for me just to drop back into being, aming, however you want to put it, I am, that I amness, must be just how it is for you and for everybody else. And so in that sense, you know, we are, we are all tapping into that same quality of being, and it's exactly the same for all of us. So in, in that way, we are one. We all, share, we all share that quality deep down. Yes, beautifully put. Thank you. Beautifully put. So uh, in your experience, um, how do we practically use this in in our every? I mean, on one level, uh, it's it doesn't need to be practical. It's enough in and of itself because when you're aming, as you put it, which I love, uh, there's this feeling of that's enough that you don't have to keep striving or pushing or pulling or doing any of that. But uh, in your studying this. Uh, how have, how have you seen it uh, applied in life that's, that you either use yourself or you find is effective for people? Mm -hmm. I think it's, in a way, it's clearing the mind of all the distracting thoughts and stuff we get caught in. And so when you clear the mind, then we can come back into the world with a lot more wisdom. We can come back seeing just noticing oh, this is what i need to be doing not from the ego mind but just from what i'm called to do from my deeper sense of being so it's not about um giving up the world or becoming an ascetic it's about frequently coming back to this quality so that we can go out into the world partly with a with a little bit quieter mind not caught up in the ego but we can go out into the world with this quality of inner freedom that we've touched upon. And so it's actually, it's removing the, the thinking patterns that actually lead us astray in the world. So we, we can come back into activity, both refreshed, but also free to really follow what the world is asking us to do, because we're not the ego mind isn't telling us must do this, must do that. So we, we have, we bring a lot more openness, compassion, love to the world. I mean, the ego mind doesn't love. It says it loves, but it doesn't really yeah, love because right. yeah. it's only concerned about me and what I get. When it says I love this, it's like I love this because it makes me feel good or whatever it is. But it's right, not. Right. It's not that real deeper love. So we, we come back with with love, with compassion, with wisdom. We're able to fulfil our function in the world much, much more effectively than when we're caught up in, as I say, all the, that thinking stuff, the worries, the ego mind. 
Mm. Very well put. Yeah. Thank and you. also, as I said, I've touched on this word, but I find when I'm when I'm in that quiet state, I see things from a different perspective. And that's that I think is the really important shift we're making. That's what letting go is, is we're seeing things from a different perspective. And instead of seeing it from the perspective of our egoic thinking, we're we're seeing it from just the perspective of how things are rather than how we think should be or whatever. Yeah, it's, a, it's we're, wouldn't you agree that it's more of a, a universal point of view or even that sounds too grand. It's more of a natural, it's a the natural, natural point. point of view. Right. And one of the terms I sometimes use for this is, is I call it natural mind. Ah, this perfect. is natural mind, the mind not perturbed by fear, concern, or undue excitement, or whatever it is. It's just the mind in its natural, untrammeled, untarnished state. But it's still there. The mind is still there, still functioning. But it's not, it's free. It's not caught up in all this other stuff. And when, when we're caught up in that stuff, we, we basically, we don't feel so good. There's, it, there's that tension and things in the background. Yeah, that's per perfect. So, um, uh, it, do you have a suggestion for everyone listening that they can do over the next day, the next week, the next month as an exploration or a challenge, a way to challenge themselves to go beyond the, the ego mind into the net and live more as the natural mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. um, what I do, and this is what I encourage people to do, is what we've been talking about, to do it as often as you can, to just pause. I actually leave notes around my house just saying pause, P-O-U-S-E, <laughs> P-A-U-S-E, pause. <laughs> and I have to move them around every day or two because I, I get used to where they are. <laughs> so, but the, but when I see that, whatever I'm doing, and it's nearly always between tasks. I'm already between tasks because I've got up, you know, from being at my computer to go and make some tea or something, and there's one sitting on my kitchen counter. It just says pause. So what I do is I just just take a few moments. It's not a long thing, but I just take a few moments. I notice where my thinking mind is going, and just as we said, just I choose not to be interested in that thought anymore, but to be interested in what's going on in the present moment. What's, what, how, how am I feeling? What's happening in my body? And as I do that, I begin to notice more of the present moment. I begin to hear maybe the bird sound around or something. And then really just what we're saying to notice how that feels, that inner sense of quietness, calmness, and and then that question of, you know, and am I not the one that is aware of all this? Just brings us back to awareness. Now, it doesn't, pretty soon you're off again. It's not a question of trying to stay there. I really want to emphasize this. It's not about trying to stay in this state. People think, oh, you know, oh, I lost it. I lost it. You're going to lose it almost instantly. But that doesn't matter. For me, the practice is coming back, you know. So when you next see it, you come back again. And gradually it becomes easy it becomes more familiar and that as that familiarity grows it's like some of it begins to be present in in the rest of my daily life but it's not don't don't feel you're failing if you know you come back to the you see you try to pause and instantly you're off you know seconds later into another thought that's fine that happens but just that intention having that intention to just pause many times a day Whenever you, just for it's just really for a few moments, just to come back, maybe half a minute or quarter of a minute, whatever, coming back to self and notice and enjoying it. I think I notice when I'm when I'm sitting in that in that state, internally sitting, there are no desires. They're not there anymore. There, there's no actual wanting anything else. Like, this is complete in itself. And to, to savor that, to actually enjoy it. Because one thing that happens, I think, in, in many meditation practices, which are 
those those that are sort of aimed at you know creating a quieter state of mind that we've been talking about people can be so involved in the practice and their mind can be quiet and they're busy you know they're quiet with the breath or something they don't actually notice how good it feels to be quiet <laughs> right. and so i think this is really important to just to savor it just to take a moment or two to just say ah this is nice this is what i've been looking for and that really reinforces it it becomes a memory that's a motivation to go back to it and it's it's giving us what we want because ultimately what we all want is to feel okay and so by just saying ah this feels good we're we're feeling that in this quiet state and that's probably one of the most valuable things i sometimes another way of putting it for myself is just to allow an inner smile to be there it's almost like allowing my being to smile ah yes this is nice yeah, yeah. so i would i would you know set oneself um a challenge maybe for a week just to do this i i say leave notes around but other things that could remind you um whatever it is i, I don't recommend putting on you know bells or alarms because that can come in the middle of what you're doing I find it much easier to do this between tasks. There's some mm. way to remind yourself and, and not to criticize yourself if you know it doesn't work like that. Just, just to practice and practice and gradually it gets easier and more familiar. Mm. And then and see, see how that is after a week. Yeah, I, I love that. And, uh, and I love that you add this thing of enjoying it. Uh, mm -hmm. otherwise it just becomes another task another thing yeah. that we have to do we should do we must do right and then we don't want to do it right right yeah. <laughs> so but if if you can if we can allow ourselves to enjoy those moments where we're more self-aware of that which we truly are mm -hmm. uh it adds depth to it and it makes it becomes candy something something we we look forward to yeah 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 and it is what we're looking for this is yeah. the thing is it's what we're looking for you put it i, I call it okay again being the most neutral word but you know, call it happiness joy peace whatever we're looking for something of that nature i just call it you know okay this is the most general thing but all all that we do all our desires are in one way or another when you analyze them what they're all about deep down everything we do we do because in one way or other we think we're going to feel better for it feeling better inside is the true bottom line that's what we're looking for ultimately is how do i feel inside do i feel do i feel better you know even when we give up our own needs and and help somebody else something like that we do that because it may be an inconvenience but we feel better for doing it. Yes. So, so that's how we all bottom line. And so the nice thing about just dropping back into our state of being is we are finding the goal of all our desires without actually having to go out and fulfill them all. Right, which is faster and easier. <laughs> much faster, much easier, much more satisfying and doesn't upset other people. <laughs> that's true. I guess the, the nature of desire, isn't it? It, it's in conflict with other your own other desires and everyone else's. So there's right. uh, that tension again. Right. Yeah. But a lot of it's about manipulating the world to get the way we want, and that you know subtly becomes manipulating other people to give us what we want. Yes. 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 Yeah. And we don't need to manipulate anybody to do this. So it's nope. it's nope. a great pointer. Thank we you. Don't, e don't even to manipulate ourselves either. That's right. so nice. That's great. That's great. It's natural. Uh, perfect and you uh, i've heard that uh, i've heard you talk about this wonderful way of being in relationship and i'd really like you to talk about that too because i think that's also something that's helpful will be very helpful for all of us yes 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 because that's where a lot of our interaction with the world comes is interacting with other beings other people 
whether it's people we're, we're close to, intimate with, or work, or whatever. And it, it's based upon a couple of things we've been talking about. One is that you know, deep down, we are all, we're all that same beingness. Uh, superficial worlds are different, but deep down, we're all that same beingness. And deep down, we all want to, to feel better. We all want to feel loved. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to be criticized. We want to feel respected. So that's a deep motivation in all of us. And what can easily happen in a relationship is, suppose you, know, you say something to me which is coming from a really clean place. But because of my own stuff, whatever it is, I perceive that as a slight threat or an attack in some way. You didn't mean it, but something in me misperceived it. So I feel, I feel slightly attacked. Now, if I'm not really 100% aware of what's going on, which most of the time I'm not, the danger is that I then, because I feel attacked, I come back it's in some way of you know attack it can be very subtle just be body language it could be a silence or it could be a more open thing of directly you know criticize hey how dare you say that or whatever but then you feel attacked and this time it's deliberate because it may be very subtle but i attacked you and then you you come back and so what happens is in relationships time and time again it's two people both of whom are looking for love, respect, to feel okay, to be at peace, not to be attacked, are actually attacking each other very subtly. Often it's, you know, everything seems fine on the surface, but it's underneath there's this little sense of attack. And the message we're giving to each other is, I don't feel fully loved by you. So I'm just gonna dig, dig the knife in a little bit. I'm just gonna attack you so that you realize the error of your ways and love me better. And when you've got two people both playing that game, it just spirals deeper and deeper and deeper into, you know, mutual, mutual attacking. As I say, it can be very subtle. Sometimes it's not, but, but that mutual attack, both people thinking this is the way I'm going to get more love is by criticizing the other person, making them feel bad for not loving me enough. The way out of it is so simple and can actually be really profound in one's life the way out of it is just to again be aware to have the intention that in any interaction with anybody my intention is that whatever i have to do or say to the other person they feel good upon receiving it they feel loved they feel respected they don't feel attacked they don't feel hurt so that that's the intention and so the intention is basically checking any, any sense of attack that's coming up, just saying, uh-uh, to yourself, I'm not going to go there. How can I say this? Even if it's something critical, it's like, how can I say this so the other person feels loved? So, I mean, a simple example, if you, know, you had to say something to somebody which was a criticism in some ways, like, you know, yeah, I'd rather you didn't do this or this makes me feel upset or whatever. But to preface it by saying, you know, I really appreciate our relationship, our friendship. And there's something I need to talk about, you know, that's going to make it be even better. The other person's going to feel respected and loved in that. And they're going to hear you in a very different way. So, so that's the basic thing is that finding ways to not attack the other person, remove the attack thoughts at their source. And many times, you know, we'll fail. And it's like, whoops, sorry, Mayor Culper didn't mean to do that. Apologize. Nothing like an apology to really set things straight. But it's beautiful when you have two people in a relationship and this is their agreement to intend not to attack each other. You can't, you can't intend, you're not, you can't say I'm not going to do it because we will do it because we, you know, none of us are perfect. But just the intention is that we will try to bring not not bring forth in any attack thoughts into our interaction something something magical happens in the relationship it's like a different form of love begins to 
be there. And it's, it's not like the romantic love or that sort of love, but it's a love which is really, it's a caring for the other person's being. It's a deep caring for how the other person is inside. I mean, we can be fairly good about caring for how the other person is out there in the world. Or, you know, do you need help? Can I help you do this? We, we care for each other that way. This is caring for the other person's inner being about how they are inside. And when that's there in a relationship, it becomes, it becomes very, very special, very special. Thank you. I, 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 that was very helpful. And I think we, we all could benefit from remembering that it, to, instead of attacking to just let go instead and find a way to say it from love as opposed to from yeah. attack. And if you look, I think you, it's easy to find if that's your intent. So it's a great, I think it's a great suggestion for all of us to bring that into our relationship. Yeah. So yeah. thank you, thank you. Yeah. So um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish up? Something that does come up, I didn't know where this came up, but I mentioned right at the start, forgiveness hmm. as being a form of letting go. And the sort of the everyday interpretation of forgiveness is, you know, you did something wrong, but I'm, I'm going to forgive you. I'm not going to punish you this time. But that that to me is not real forgiveness. In fact, if you look at the word, the Greek word for forgiveness, it's aphesis, which means to let go as in physically letting go. You're holding a rock, is that le physically letting go of something. And so forgiveness is not really forgiving the other person, but it's the letting go of the judgment we have about them, letting go of the grievance. So it's something we do for ourselves in a sense that when we let go of our judgment against the other person, we we actually feel better for it because we're not making ourselves so upset by the grieving, whatever it is, the grievance, the judgment. In some ways, the other person may not even know you've forgiven them. <laughs> they, they may not even know you haven't forgiven them. That's right, either way. <laughs> either way. It's something, but we let go inside. And then when we let go of the judgment, then the love returns because... I often say the, the opposite to love is not hate. The opposite to love is judgment. Hmm. Not accepting, not allowing another person to just be there as they are. Hmm. So that, that for me is forgiveness. It's just like saying, ah, I, I see where I'm judging the other person. And actually something that helps sometimes is to say, you know, if I was in their shoes, if I had the life they had, whatever it is, and well, a bad night or whatever they had, would I have acted this way? And probably, yes, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. Yes. So putting yourself in another person's shoes is another way of letting go of that judgment. Because the judgment says they should not have behaved like this. Whereas if you really put yourself in their shoes, it's like, well, given everything in their life that led up to this, this is exactly how they should have behaved. There's no, right. no other way when you right. really understand them. Yes, yes. Yeah. Beautifully put. Yeah. If the more we can see from, from that more universal point of view, and you're opening to all the different flavors, including the person that appears to have wronged you in some way, yeah. it really does liberate you. It really does. It's yeah. and it's a wonderful feeling. And it and, and I believe I'm glad you added that because that's I think that's a key way to support the thing you mentioned earlier about how to relate because yeah. that's a key part of it. So yeah. I, I think it, that helps complete the picture, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, because that judgment is often the source of the attacking thought. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it does. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. This was lovely. I, I really enjoyed it. I think all of us who, who uh, listen to this will, will benefit from it. So this was great. So yeah. everyone listening, thank you for uh, sharing this time with us. Uh, Peter and I really appreciate it. And uh, I think that's all for now. Yeah, and thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your leading this whole discussion.
<laughs> well, I th it was more of a mutual thing. I don't know if I was really <laughs> leading anything, but <laughs> whatever. You were whatever. actually easy to follow. <laughs> 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 lovely <laughs> yeah lovely so again thank you peter and thank you everyone for listening thank you. i hope you enjoyed our time with peter russell you can learn more about him and his book seeds of awakening and from science to god in the program notes or by going to his website peterrussell.com that's easy to remember, peterrussell.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, give us a five-star rating, and share it with people you care about. These episodes are dedicated to sharing the eternal teachings from the greatest secret. As Rhonda said, we've missed the truth for thousands of years because we've not looked at what is right in front of us. We've become easily distracted by our problems, the drama in our lives, the coming and goings of the events in the world, and we've missed the greatest discovery we can make, a discovery that can take us out of suffering and into lasting bliss and happiness. If you'd like to learn more about my work, my mentor Lester Levinson's work, and the Sedona Method, please visit Sedona.com. As you explore our site, you will learn the key to lasting happiness, success, peace, and emotional well being. We have books, courses, events, and plenty of free material to explore. Again, go to Sedona.com. Thank you for being here, and we'll catch you in the next episode of Wedding Go and the Greatest Secret.